Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. President Trump is leaving office on a killing spree. The federal government has executed 10 prisoners. That's the most in more than 120 years. And there are still three more federal executions slated for before Trump leaves office. Well, joining me is George Hale. He is a reporter who covers federal executions for NPR. George, welcome to Pushback. Hey, thanks for being, thanks for having me. You are based in Indiana where these federal executions take place. Just give us a sense of what's been happening, this unprecedented amount of executions and how you've been covering them. Yeah, sure. So they actually started before I arrived in Indiana in um, in January, or they were planned to start. Um, but there was a sort of last minute court um, action as tends to happen in federal executions or any executions, actually. And um, they were on hold for a while until um, finally this summer um, they started. And um, a colleague of mine at the station, Adam Pink, uh, Pinsker, he was the one who had been uh, set to cover them before. And so when they actually started happening, uh, he ended up being the one to, you know, to cover them. What we didn't, of course, know is that it was going to be this continuous, you know, um, spree, like you said in the introduction, like an, an execution spree um, that was going to go on for the rest of the year. And so after uh, Adam witnessed five people killed in front of his face uh, five times in a row, he, uh, you know, he basically said he couldn't do this anymore, not, not uh, at all, but just not, you know, just continuous, uh, continuously. And so I sort of subbed in to help him out with that. And we've kind of been switching off, um, you know, to the best we can, our best of our ability since then. And so the last two were just uh, two weeks ago. So take us inside the chamber. What have you witnessed? So starting in September, I, um, the first execution that I attended was of a man named William LaCroix. It was one of two executions in the same week, as Tuesday and a Thursday. Um, the execution chamber itself is a tiny room. I think I've read it's 10 feet by 12 feet or something like that. Um, and then, uh, there's witnesses on, on sort of on the other side of glass. Um, and that's, so the media, the media witnesses are in a kind of a separate room, but it feels like you're in the same room. It's actually kind of like a recording studio now that I think about it. Um, it's like you're there together, but not really. Um, and so to, so in my experience, there's never been more than, uh, six people, including me, um, attending these executions. And so. Um, yeah, so they bring the media into a s specific room, and there's also uh, separate rooms for um, like the family of the victims, and then the family of the you know future victim, the person being executed. Um, but they can also observe what happens um, separately, so we're all sort of separated from each other. So the most recent execution was Alfred Bourgeois. You were there. I was. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, the most recent one. And take us through that. So Alfred Bourgeois' execution is actually really interesting. Um, it's, you know, it's, I, was, I was saying this privately to someone else, but I don't have a problem saying it publicly either. It's probably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, it took this guy, I want to say it was either 26 or 28 minutes to die, um, with nearly twice as long as it took the person that was executed um, actually the night before um, to die, you know, with the exact same chemicals, presumably. Um, there are a few other reasons why I found it really disturbing. Um, the, his body made these extremely unusual movements or contractions, uh, heaving me, me and the AP reporter actually kind of go back and forth on who's using the right word. Is it contracting or heaving? So we're trying to you know, sort of invent a language to describe a completely unnatural phenomenon, which is the body's reaction to these uh, you know, medications that are being used in a you know, completely non-medical sense. And um, the, the torso can react in a really strange way. Um, and, you know, there, you can, we can really go into the weeds on that, but there's some reasons for that that, that some doctors speculate. Uh, it could be because their um, body is basically uh, trying to breathe without the, the use of their lungs. And so um, anyway, so his, his reaction to that I found really disturbing because it was so pronounced. Um, the way that his body was reacting. Um, the other thing that was super disturbing about it, and I think sort of 
is what made it all so disturbing in sort of its totality is that uh, he adamantly denied um, doing what he was there for. His last words, he spent them um, insisting that he was innocent and trying to convince me and five other people, um, you know, standing in front of him that this was all a huge mistake. Um, and so I don't know whether or not that's true. I think there's actually a lot of evidence that he is guilty on some level of what he did, what he's accused of doing, but just the sort of combination of those things, you know, I found sort of extremely disturbing. He was convicted of killing a toddler, his, his own child, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's not as simple as maybe the way that the prosecutors alleged, although I know the least about his case probably compared to any of the other ones I've witnessed, unfortunately. Um, I do know that there's been a lot of question marks about some allegations that he had sexually assaulted his daughter. Um, and obviously that would matter a lot you know, if that were true, because that's something that, you know, people have kind of a visceral reaction to that sort of thing. You can imagine a jury more likely to send someone to death if they thought that, you know, not only did he murder his daughter, but he raped her too. Um, and that was one of the things he really adamantly denied. He said, I never molested anyone in my life. The uh, first execution of a woman in 70 years is supposed to happen on January 12th. The, the prisoner is Lisa Montgomery. Her case is really horrific. The crime itself, convicted of killing a pregnant woman and cutting out the baby. She herself has a horrific history of personal abuse from a very young age. Talk to us about that case and what it's, you know, how it's impacted the conversation around the uh, death penalty. Yeah, so, right. So if, if I knew the least about Alfred Bourgeois' case, I think I know the most about Lisa Montgomery's. Um, we've, not just me, but other people from our station have spent, um, I guess, months at this point, you know, interviewing people. I've been to actually the crime scene. I've been to that house where it happened. I've been inside in the room, even where it happened. Um, the courtroom, I've interviewed the prosecutor, the, the sheriff who recovered her baby, you know, sort of every angle of that story. And um it is a really unique situation, I think, beyond the fact that she's a woman, although I do think that that's something that we should also be talking about. But um, Lisa Montgomery is the only uh, person on death row, either federal or state, who's done something like this. And I think the reason for that is a good reason. And it's that people who do that sort of thing are, tend to be mentally ill, you know. And I think juries are reluctant to sentence someone to death if they think that there's questions about their, you know, their state of mind. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that makes uh, Lisa's case not just unique, but it's sort of unheard of. I don't think that any other person has been sentenced to death for something like this. And I should add also, and this is something that I found um, really surprising, is that uh, that kind of crime actually isn't that unheard of. It, it actually just happened two months ago in Texas. Um, it's happened, um, you know, I think it, according to experts we talked to maybe between like 30 and 40 times since the sixties. And so um, while I think that the prosecutors obviously played up how extreme and unusual this was, um, it's actually not, you know, as horrific and horrible as it is, it's not uh, necessarily this uniquely sort of evil act. That makes sense. As Trump has presided over this rush to execute people, it's meant that this year the federal government has killed more people than all the states combined, which I believe is the first time ever that that has happened. H how have they also loosened the restrictions and even the killing methods to expedite this process? Can you talk about that aspect? Yeah, sure. It, it, yes, it's so unusual for obviously the federal government, which um, you know, usually executes less than um, what one state, you know, one death penalty state would um, to execute more people than all of the you know states combined. It's sort of an unthinkable um, figure. But I think that the, the reason for that is probably because obviously we have Donald Trump in office and he's willing to do things like this, but also the pandemic. Uh, these states that execute people, they know that they can just go back to executing people when there's a vaccine, you know, or when we have maybe some kind of better uh, system for keeping people safe in large gatherings and, you know, small rooms. Um, but 
the Donald, the Trump administration, you know, they know now, especially, and they probably had a guess before that um, they really only have until January 20th to carry these executions out. And so the pandemic is sort of just, um, you know, a minor obstacle as far as they're concerned, because um, there's no, there's no waiting. Um, you know, Joe Biden has indicated that he would uh, likely not uh, continue these sorts of things, these sorts of executions. And um, I think that the, you know, the Trump administration knows that. And so that's not a coincidence. I think that they've all been scheduled before the 20th too, the remaining ones. And meanwhile, Biden has called for a moratorium on federal executions. Have you spoken to any family members or attorneys who have to grapple with this, that if this were just a month later, that their client, their loved one would not be being put to death by their own government? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I talk to these family members and defense attorneys and loved ones every day. I mean, just on, um, I guess it was Friday night, I was talking to the, to the attorney for, um, one of the attorneys for Brandon Bernard, who was, or uh, one of the investigators, I guess, for the federal defenders. And, um, you know, she was holding back tears, just saying, you know, if we had just managed to get a couple more days, you know, uh, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Um, it's extremely, I mean, it's disturbing beyond belief for these defense attorneys, because, you know, they, they, they've been representing these people. They, they are on death row, but nobody thought they were actually going to be executed because only before this started, only three people on death row had been executed since 2001. I mean, one of them was Timothy McVeigh, you know, it, the, like to have someone who played like a small part in a crime, like, you know, speaking of Bernard, like in Bernard's case, um, it didn't even occur to them that they were going to be executed. At least Montgomery's daughter told me that, that she never imagined they were actually going to execute her mother. She's not even in Indiana. She's uh, in, in a sort of a hospital prison in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, yeah. And so, so many different people involved in this, you know, have been um, not just shocked, but like devastated by the fact that this has happened so quickly and they've had so little time to prepare. And then they've also had so such little, um, interest in most of the cases too. And that's, I think, another really important aspect of this. Um, it seems like lately there's been a little bit more interest, but overall, you know, I think that this has gone kind of unnoticed, at least for the, the first half, or at least that's how it's felt for me. Um, and I can't imagine what it's been been like for them um, trying to, you know, raise, raise awareness of the fact that um, their clients were, you know, about to be, be killed. How about victims' families? Do you come across them when you're covering these executions? We try to. You know, it's interesting because I think that um, police in general, but the Justice Department in particular, is very is really successful in kind of controlling the narrative as much as they can from from that perspective. And so I I I believe that they probably you know, or at least some people involved tell victims' families not to talk to the media. Either that, or there's you know. Maybe they just don't trust us. I don't know, but um, we've heard a little bit. You know, we we I the last execution, or sorry, the second to last execution was that um, ten members of the victim's family showed up, um, and you know, thanks Donald Trump, thanks uh, you know uh, AG Barr, and um, you know tried to kind of counterbalance sort of some of the um, I guess support that this particular. Um, person had had received from like uh, from the media, you know, or at least the perception of that. Um, but yeah, obviously this is an incredibly traumatizing experience for the victims' families as well. And you know, I I don't speak for them, and I certainly you know wouldn't tell them how to feel. But I can't imagine that um, having these things dragged back up all of a sudden like this. How you know traumatizing that would be. And although I should point out that most of the time when they've issued statements um, after the execution, they've, it's usually been to thank the uh, Justice Department or Donald Trump for doing it. So um, I guess, you know, overall on balance, some people are very okay with this. I should point out too, others, other family members of victims have urged uh, the executions to not happen. So that has happened as well. And a few weeks ago, it was reported that, and we talked about this a bit earlier, but among the loosening guidelines that Trump was trying to implement would be to allow for electrocution and even firing squads. 
has that been implemented as a as an official policy? Yeah, it's hard to kind of hard to follow the logic of what they're doing there. I'm not I, I, I'm not sure that I personally get it enough to really explain it here. Um, my understanding is that this is unlikely to have an effect on any of the upcoming executions. Um, all of the actually the ones that are scheduled right now, they, the government has indicated that it does uh, plan to use lethal injection. Um, one case, it hasn't actually indicated which method it, it plans to use. Uh, but it certainly hasn't suggested that it's going to use a different method. Um, and I also have no idea how, uh, you know, a gas chamber, for example, could be constructed that quickly. Um, or, you know, the, like, the, I imagine, you know, endless litigation that would happen if they actually decided they were going to hire a team of like marksmen to shoot someone, you know, outside the prison. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, so I can't speak to, as much to what they're doing with that. I, I, the best I've heard from other like sort of legal experts and other lawyers is that they're probably checking a bunch of boxes um, for which like legal technicalities. I think possibly related to um, states that don't execute people anymore because they're supposed to follow state guidelines when they um, execute people here. And so you know, each state varies from the next, sometimes in major ways, but usually in really small ones. And um, so I think that they don't know exactly what to do when one state doesn't have the death penalty anymore. And that's what that's what I understand, at least. Brandon Bernard, you mentioned him earlier, but that was a controversial case because he was 18 years old at a time when he was he took part in a murder or allegedly took part in a murder. But then you have jurors coming out and opposing his execution, even an ex prosecutor opposed his execution. Can you talk to us about that case? Yeah, so. Um... That, that was something that was hard to see. I, I was, again, the witness for that one for um, NPR and for my own station. And um, I was also the witness for the execution of the actual shooter in that case named Christopher Vialva. Um, and from everything that I've, I've, I understand about Christopher Vialva and from our communication um, you know, with each other, which is very limited and through a lawyer, um, you know, he had always taken responsibility for what he did. And so um, he never tried to, to blame it on the other people who were present or, you know, you know sort of slightly involved. Um, and so, you know, while I had misgivings about watching, you know, him being executed as well, just knowing how much he had reformed his life and had taken responsibility and tried to be a, you know, a really good person, um, it sort of added an extra level of concern seeing somebody get the exact same sentence and then witnessing that sentence being carried out because even according to the government, Brandon Bernard never shot anyone. He, you know, there's not even really any evidence that he knew that Christopher Vialva was going to shoot anyone. He was just um, driving the car. He was, he was driving the car. It was his mom's car. I think um, it's more than that. He, um, he lit the car. He lit the, the car of the, um, the victims on fire. So after Christopher Vialva shot them both in the trunk of the car, um, according to, from what I understand, uh, from you know, according to the witnesses there, um, without any warning to anyone, he was going to do this. In fact, I believe he was actually wearing a mask before he did it. So, you know, to indicate that, or at least the others would, you know, would have assumed that he was wearing the mask because those people were going to be let go. Um, but for whatever reason, he decided to shoot them. Um, he, it depends on who you ask and it depends on, you know, which, which, version you're hearing, but for, you know, from what I understand is that Christopher Vialva told Brandon Bernard to set the car on fire um, after he had shot both of these people in the head. And um, you know, from the, from his perspective, Brandon Bernard's perspective is an 18 year old, very low ranking member of this gang. If we're going to call it a gang, um, you know, his involvement was very minimal and probably akin to destroying evidence or something like that, you know, or uh, you know, screwing with a body or whatever the, the legal term is for that, you know, definitely crimes, but not crimes you execute people for. And definitely not the, the worst of the worst criminals that you imagine when you think of the people being put to death, you know? And so um, the government actually argued that uh, they had found soot in the lungs of one of the two victims, uh, Stacy Bagley. And that indicated at least to the, the expert that testified that it meant that she might've died if not from the gunshot alone, possibly, you know, in combination with the smoke inhalation from the fire that Brandon set. 
And so that meant that, you know, technically, if we're being very, very technical, Brandon did contribute to her murder in a direct you know, way. Um, however, the defense has argued that the, the, uh, the gunshots were certainly fatal. I mean, there were, there were gunshots to the head, you know, and um, that St- Stacey Bagley certainly didn't suffer anymore because of Brandon's actions. And they also argued that the scientific evidence for um, the smoke inhalation is itself possibly just junk science. Um, so for multiple different reasons, uh, you know, Brandon's supporters and his lawyers, um, and not just them, uh, you know, his jurors and the prosecutor actually who helped defeat his appeal, um, all of them have, you know, had urged the government to reconsider um, carrying out his execution. George, we're going to wrap. So as you mentioned earlier, this is a topic that has not gotten very much attention in Trump's final weeks in office. So any final words about what you think people should know about this federal execution spree? I guess there's a couple of different things, but you know, one is that there's a pandemic going on. This is not a safe environment for this to be occurring. Um, there's p- these people come in from hundreds of miles away, uh, the execution team to carry out these executions. And um, uh, in several cases, the, they've spread the virus. I think it's pretty clear that they have contributed to the outbreak that the prison is, is experiencing right now, which is so severe that two of the um, three people who are set to be executed in January have both come down with COVID. Um, and it seems like anybody who actually encounters these people has come down with COVID. Um, or, you know, it's not actually true, but it seems that way from the, the sort of the list of names that we keep getting, the spiritual advisor of the, the person who was executed before the last two, um, uh, Yusuf Noor, got COVID. Um, it, was, it was actually interesting. It was right after the executions, he told me personally, he said it was so unsafe. No one was wearing masks. I'm sure that I got COVID. You know, he was like, so afraid of it. And then, you know, lo and behold, like a week or week and a half later, he did get diagnosed with COVID uh, or tested positive. Um, so I think that's one sort of aspect that sort of needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and then the other one is that, is I guess, I don't know how much time you have, but I, I'd love to talk a little bit about Lisa's case, just so people really understand. Lisa Montgomery. Yeah. So, you know, if if everything goes according to plan, this is the last time that I'll, have, I'll ever witness an execution. Uh, my colleague Adam has agreed to take the um, the two other ones. Um, Lisa Montgomery's case is so unusual um, that I really wonder if, I guess, we as a society should be comfortable with what's about to happen. And I'll just back up and say that um, after speaking to investigators and psychologists and social workers and many people who have evaluated Lisa, it, it's really obvious to me um, that she is severely mentally ill. Um, you know, her, her own lawyer describes her as psychotic. She uses the word psychotic. Um, and there's a, there's a number of reasons why she might be that 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 mentally ill. There's there's lots of evidence that she has an unusual amount of mentally ill people in her own family. Um, there's evidence that she's had multiple traumatic brain injuries, and then there's also evidence that her jury never got to see in detail, which is that she suffered a level of abuse that sort of makes you uncomfortable using the word abuse. Like it just seems like it's sort of too understated, like. When I say abuse, I mean she was sex trafficked as a child by her own family, um, and was raped. You know, in every orifice, urinated on. Um, her stepfather actually built a separate room in her um, in his his house to uh, allow direct access for men to rape her. All this time, she's a minor. Um, I spoke to one expert at Bellevue Hospital in New York who told me that after evaluating Lisa, you know, she she feels that her brain essentially rewired itself to cope with the kind of trauma and invented a new reality that was um, basically safer for her to live in. Um, and that she's just not well. Um, she's The government has her on antipsychotic medications right now, which I find really ironic um, that they're about to execute somebody that they themselves are acknowledging every time they write a new prescription, you know, uh, is in need of severe, you know, serious um, medical interventions for her mental health. Um, and anyway, so, I, you know, I, I've seen like a lot of reports about this case that sort of says, you know, it, it puts it in like a he said, she said kind of way, you know, where the, the government says that, well, she did this horrible act and deserves to die. And then her lawyers say, well, actually, she's had a really rough childhood and um, probably has some mental health problems. And uh, I think that that's really important that we just like 
make sure that we're not um, glossing over some extremely unusual and severe um, circumstances like uh, behind what, you know, what she became as an adult, I guess. Well, do you see any chance of it being remedied at the court level? Are there prospects for a judge to hear all this and to intervene? You know, it's interesting, actually, they tried. And a lot of this evidence came came up as a result of an investigation uh, by a, a specialist, someone who specializes in investigating these sorts of things, a, a psychologist and social worker. Um, she told me, she actually sent me the slides for this. Uh, she prepared, she spent eight months preparing a presentation um, in an appeals hearing um, for Lisa in, I, th I think it was 2016, um, she said that she was usually, you know, when she's called to to testify in such cases that she spends, you know, two to three days, um, full days testifying and explaining these things. Um, I believe the judge gave her, I want to say it was either half an hour or two hours, I could be mixing it up, but a very small amount of time to actually um, explain what happened. And she said that she, you know, just kind of lost, uh, you know, kind of like lost hope in sort of the entire system after that happened because, um, it, meant, it meant that the people who needed to hear um, this stuff, this background, um, both the jury in, in Lisa's original trial and then the, the people evaluating whether or not her original trial was fair, whether or not her original lawyer was you know, good enough, um, that no one who actually matters ever learned these really important details about what happened to her and what might have contributed to this horrific act. Um, and so now we're actually left with the only person, as far as I understand, you could ask one of her lawyers, they might be able to clarify her options better. But to my knowledge, the only person who actually has any control over this really um, is Donald Trump. And so her lawyers have this task where they need to convince Donald Trump that um, her case is different. And, um, and this, so they're doing that right now. They're preparing uh, the clemency application, which I think is due within days. Um, and that's what they'll, they'll try to do is they'll try to convince him and his administration to make an exception. And of course, just to clarify, they're not asking that she be released from prison. Um, they're just asking that she be allowed to live the rest of her natural life uh, behind bars uh, and not be executed um, on January 12th. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. George Hale is a reporter covering federal executions for NPR. George, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you.